All right, I'm just sitting here drawing, so we're just gonna go. We're just gonna go. Hello, BBQ Ted. Hello, Mikhail Mag Magnu Magnusson. Magnusson. Good dog from Stockholm, Sweden. Hello. Greetings from New York. I just had a conversation a couple days ago with someone from Stockholm, the inimitable Miles Johnston. Conversation with him will be coming out on the channel very soon. I might even post it today, actually. I might post it once I get off stream. Hello to Carl Kasaklang. Hello to Jack. What time is it in New York? It is 9.37 a.m. Baby. Steven, did you know you're a little cute? Um, my wife keeps saying that. Noah Berkland, but uh, I'm inclined not to believe her. But I'll believe you. I trust you more than I trust my wife, for sure. Greetings from North Africa. Well, greetings, Mohammed. Greetings from New York, from the Big Apple, from the tiny city, as they call it, from the small, uninteresting city, as, it is, as it's usually called. All right, everybody. Um, yep, yeah, I'm drawing Venom today. I don't know why. Um, I did this sketch in my sketchbook this morning with my morning coffee, and it just came out looking like Venom. So I was like, when I moved it over to digital to do something on stream, I just went with the vet Venom scheme and actually put the icon on it. The, the sketch wasn't explicitly supposed to be Venom. Like usual, I started with a weird body. And then when I got up to the, ha to the head, I did the big mouth and the long tongue. It's like, it always looks like Venom. So just lean into it. So let's chill, let's draw, let's be happy. Nice and early here in New York, not too hot, not too hot, not too cold. As we New Yorkers like to say, hot and cold. It's 9.38 a.m. Been drawing since the wee hours, since 6 a.m. or something like that. Beautiful way to pass time, beautiful way to pass a life, really. I hope you're all feeling well. Hope you're all feeling energized, happy, present, vaguely whimsical. I just saw uh, one of my best friends, who I've been best friends with since uh, high school, Michael Bowe, the actor, just saw him live on Pix11 News a couple minutes before this. I caught his interview with the morning news team and then hopped on stream. How do I get Universal Forces to talk to me and force me to draw? Oh man, you gotta invite him in. You just gotta invite him in. Just don't resist. Let the forces in. Too bright. I mean, I need to jump to that so quick. I'm gonna draw, try to draw nice and slow and patiently today. Build things up a little bit by little bit. Might jump to doing a different sketch of Venom, but even if I do that, we'll try to build up that sketch little bit by little bit. Be patient. I'm not trying to knock out a full render or anything. I always say that and then just because I'm talking to people and hanging out, I always wind up jumping ahead, shooting contrast everywhere. I'm gonna shoot my contrast. Am I feeling, I'm feeling better. I just remembered Thyrandor. Yeah, Thyrandor brings us all joy. I mean, he's a, a mystical font of happiness. You know, that's what he's uh, one of the dragon gods of. Sphinx god, Chimera god, however you interpret him. I mean, truly his form is just a representation of something beyond form. So he's really uh, too much to really explain. It's just the form you happen to see him in, but he is something beyond that. He is that and yet so much more. 
It's not to say that it's an inaccurate representation. It's almost like he's a, that representation is simply a cross section of a higher dimensional being. Hello, Yoga, Satrianda. How's the music? Does my voice sound all right? Am I loud enough? The music is hopefully just stepped back in the background for peaceful drawing purposes. Everybody feel that way? Let me reposition my neck and my body. My neck and my body and my hair and my eyebrows and my mustache and my lips and my teeth. Let me twist this neck, this neck that has seen so much. Let me twist this neck the other way, this neck that has lost so much. Okay. Hi, Stephen. Last year, you said you were planning to document the making of a project folio. Is it still in the making? Uh, I would not say it has been actively in the making, but it has always been near the top of the to-do list. I mean, it's something I've always wanted to do as a teacher because um, it's not really out there. Um, the, only, the only thing is that it's just, it's not out there because it's so hard to do, you know? I want to have an example out there for people of, here's how you put together a project folio. But um, in order to, for me to do that, I need to, I can't fake it. I have to make a <laughs> project folio start to finish, which is, um, you know, that would define anybody's year to do that. So it's a hard thing to make the space for, but um, it's something I've always felt very motivated to do. I want to do it. So it will happen. It's possible that um, that will effectively become um, a part of Principles of Design, which is a course I've always wanted to make. But doing the assignments for Principles of Design, doing the assignment demos would basically amount to an example of making a whole project folio. Hey, Mr. Zapata, did you see the new Cintiq 27 Pro? I saw the, um, I don't know if they put out an English release. I saw just like images when they put out the Japanese release. So I couldn't get much detail. I haven't seen it since. I, um, I'll be interested to hear if they're better. I'm pretty, uh, pretty anti Cintiq <laughs> these days, but, um, I, I just, I'll be interested to hear if people think that it's fixed a lot of the problems. Um, the Cintiqs are just bad monitors. They're just bad monitors. They're grayed out. They generally haven't had enough pixel density to prevent screen door effect. The texture layer that they add over it just dirties the screen, which uh, I'm used to looking at like a glossy iMac screen so it's very distracting and um, they're just poor quality panels. I mean, everybody's Cintiq either ships with or acquires dead and stuck pixels. It's just, um, it's not a problem necessarily with the product design. It's like, it's a product with their supply chains and how they source and whatever vendors they're using for the screens. It's just, it's embarrassing for such an expensive product. That's why I was happy to go to um, one of the cheaper options that I know is worse, but it's like when I got a screen tablet, that's what I'm drawing on right now. I was like, of course I'm gonna get a Huey on because if it's, if it's going to be the difference between a C product or a C plus product, I'm going to take the one that's half the price for sure.
Steven, did you attend the Lightbox event yesterday? What event was yesterday? I didn't know there was a Lightbox event yesterday. That should also answer the question. I did not attend. I was gonna go to Lightbox this year, but um, I've been trying to move and uh, we thought maybe October would be the month and I couldn't just like leave it to my wife to do alone, you know? But um, did not turn out to be the month. Next year, I'm definitely going. I'm sure my I will have decided on a living situation by then. I will definitely go next year. I want to hang out. Nick Ravioli, how are you? Man, I've been holding off on getting a screen tablet. Not sure if it's a worthwhile investment yet. Uh, the general rule of thumb I tell people is if you mostly draw, it's not. Or, or um, sorry, if you mostly draw, it is. And if you mostly paint, it probably is not. Also, if you do mostly draw, I would consider getting a... Um, an iPad Pro before getting a screen tablet. Unless you have very specific dreams or goals of getting into the commercial industries, I think the iPad Pro um, gives you all the drawing ability you would want from a screen, a screen tablet, but it's cheaper and it's more versatile and it's a full computer. Um, for me, that it's more worth the money, but... Um, if you want to work at a company or something like that, you that's not right now. That's not realistically an option because you can't use professional level apps and do large file management and stuff like that. Oh, does the screen make drawing easier? Well, it doesn't it doesn't make it easier than drawing on paper, but um it's easier than trying to do the hand-eye coordination trick of drawing on a screenless tablet. But um, I'll be honest with you, at, you can actually bring them up to equal. After years of drawing on a tablet, um, I find that my drawings with the screenless tablet are just as good as ones that I would do with the screen. I just need to do slightly more adjustments, you know? It's like when I, I'll do a demonstration here. When I draw on a Cintiq type thing, it's like, let's say I'm drawing a leg. I can do the energy and the proportions at the same time, the way that I do on paper. And then when I'm drawing with a, with a screen less tablet, I just go for the energy, but usually my proportions are off. I'll get a result like that. So I just got used to very quickly opening up the lasso tool, quickly dragging to adjust for the proportions, and then boom, I've arrived at a, at a result that's close enough. So that's how I got used to drawing on a screenless tablet, just got more used to moment to moment doing little adjustments with the lasso tool. And I personally find the screenless tablets much more comfortable. You get to like kick back and sort of not be hunched over the whole time. Is this on an iPad? No, I'm in Photoshop. I'm on a Huey on screen tablet right now. I only started using the screen tablet uh, back in July, only a few months ago. I got it because uh, I needed to do a lot of notes for my course. And one thing the screen tablets are definitely good for is handwriting and doing notes and stuff like that. So I got it for that. But up until July, I've always been a screenless tablet guy.
RC and Light says, I overthink buying a tablet. Um, my general review is that uh, they're all terrible. I, I personally don't think any of them are ideal and uh, they all have huge drawbacks. Um, I would not worry about it. Don't overthink it because uh, they're all bad. <laughs> Wacom is overpriced and has um, horrible driver issues, new glitches every update, bad support, uh, and their most expensive products have bad vendors and bad supply chain sourcing and things like that. So they have bad screens and everything. Their competitors in that space, like Huion, have all the same problems, bad drivers, bad updates. They ruin your computer, but they're not overpriced. They're half the price. Um, the iPad is very, very, very good, but a lot of people will uh, just not think the screen is big enough or they don't like that there is no pen hover, even though the newest ones do have pen hover. Um, they all have problems. None of them are ideal. The only perfect tool is, of course, pencil and paper. Um, that's a joke out there. It's obviously, everything has drawbacks and pros, but um, I don't think you need to overthink it. They're all terrible. Just buy whatever's gonna make you feel cool. <laughs> That's what you were gonna do anyway, so. Hello, Devious Bum. Hello, Corey. I never do fan art. This will be the one one piece of fan art that I do for the uh, for the year, most likely. It's not even really fan art, cause uh, am I a fan of Venom? I don't know anything about Venom. I know he's Eddie Brock sometimes, but um, I'm not actually a fan of Venom. It's just that he's an easy thing for me to backslide into because, well, his design is so cool. I mean, it's obviously one of the coolest ever designs. But um, just my drawings kind of accidentally become Venom, so it's like it's an, ac an easy thing to backslide into. Hi, Dilshan. I feel like I'm not putting down the opacity that I want. Is drawing the best or what? I love drawing.
Do I want to do a cooler venom? They show him different ways. Sometimes he's truly black. Sometimes he's bluish. Sometimes he's purplish. That cooler scheme is kind of nice. Let's keep that in the back pocket. Let's keep doing him kind of neutral gray for a bit. Oh, I should have saved those teeth on another layer. I messed that up, tell you what. I want those to get very clean. I will need to um, basically paint them out and then do them fresh on a new layer. But my God. God, am I lazy to do that. When we get to rendering the mouth, I'll, uh, I'll make them disappear and it'll start to look distinctly unvenom like and then I'll add them back afterwards. problem worse too. I just wanted to freely design like the little teeth and the big teeth overlapping. Nick Ravioli says, I'm giving Paradise Lost English another try and I'm actually making way better progress this time around, but it's still tough to read. It is, it is tough to read, but uh, it's great that you're giving it another shot. I mean, I think it's awesome. <laughs> I love it so much. I love it so much. When he describes all those fallen in the lake of fire, ugh. yeah, the opening is great. It's one of the, I mean, I'd recommend anybody at least just read that opening, like the first half of book one. It's like, even if you don't stick it out, um, the first half of book one is such a punch in the face. Like what, <laughs> I'd put it up against anything. I think it's my favorite thing. Hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky. He with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. From those flames, no light, but rather darkness visible. Served only to illumine those duller shades. Sorry if I'm a little bit more quiet than usual today. I just, uh, I was really hankering to draw when I started stream.
We got some good stuff coming out on the channel soon. I've got a uh, conversation with Miles Johnston ready to go. That's out in early access right now for the people on Patreon. Conversation with Miles about uh, his thoughts on the AIs. Some musings about the ethics around it and the uh, stresses of artists around it. It was very nice to talk with him. If you don't know his work, Miles is fantastic, but um, he's always got very interesting thoughts on art. So that'll be out soon. I've got a podcast with Podkist. I've got a podkist with my good friend Ahmed Alduri. That was a really fun one. That one will come out in the next few days. That's also an early access for the Patreon people. Love Miles, his art is great, some of my faves. Yeah, he's top tier. I mean, he's been a big inspiration to me. He's one of the best. Been a fan of Miles for a long, 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 long time. Long, 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 long time. Nerdy's Bird says, it's a school day, but I always watch anyway. See, Nerdy? You're so dedicated. Hey, Steve, how would you recommend an independent artist start his career? What are some ways to make money off of your work other than teaching? Um, I think sort of low-level, cheap commissions are the way most people like to start if you want to keep it independent. Um, the advice I would give there, I, I personally haven't done this, but I know a lot of people who have had success with this, is pick a fandom or a genre that you genuinely like doing. Don't do anything you're not interested in because that's always going to backfire and it's going to hurt your art soul. In the long run, it'll make it more difficult for you to keep up your career. So don't do anything that you're uninterested in, right? Because that'll drive you nuts. But Pick a fandom or genre that you genuinely really like and make a small body of work, you know, five pieces or something like that, that shows a consistent style that knows its audience, that is going for that genre, for that fandom, and then join the communities around that thing. And not in a weird way, but just honestly let people know, like, I love this stuff, I'm here, this is what my work looks like, and I'm open for commissions. And um, you might be surprised. Who wants you to help them out? Because in those communities, those people are already friends with each other. They want to commission artists to do ideas. Um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, but like ships and fan fictions and, you know, they're friends with other people in the community. They want to commission a drawing for a friend of theirs online and then give it to them as a birthday gift or something like that. Like there's, um, there's a lot of little stuff to be done there. And then since they're just um, small commissions for normal people, not for companies, you can put that stuff in your portfolio immediately if you do it really well. You can stream it to try to build a streaming audience while you work on it, things like that. I have a friend whose love for art was nearly entirely eroded from doing commissions. Yeah, that's why you've got to, you've got to keep it sustainable and you've got to, don't, don't fake it. Like you've got to really like the thing. Don't do anything you don't like doing or else, yeah, that'll happen. Also, sometimes we just have to face the reality that, um, I think this is something that goes unsaid a lot of the time, but I think it's important to talk about it honestly you might have the temperament where there is no sustainable way for you to make money with your art at a low level. Um, 
you may not like doing fan art. You may not like working for others. You may not like pandering your work at all. There's nothing, and by pandering, I mean tailoring it to a community for its own sake. If you're doing it out of genuine love, it's not pandering, but for its own sake, if you're just, you don't like the thing that much, but you, you're just doing it to get it into the community, that's pandering. Um, you, you can't feel entitled then to making a low level living with your art. You have to accept who you are and accept that you're only going to be happy in doing art sustainably if you're doing whatever you want for a lot of money. And you have to be honest that that is a tough road to hoe and a steep hill to climb. And you just need to accept that you need to have another job or a, a supportive family or a spouse or something like that. Just swallow your pride and accept that you are one of those people who needs to live like someone who's being supported by a Medici for a while in Renaissance Italy and own it. Just go in on it. Don't pretend that you're gonna be a commercial artist or do these low level commissions or all that stuff and support yourself in another way until you're at the level where you can do whatever you want for a living. Um, because otherwise you're going to burn yourself out completely and destroy your art heart. So just be honest with yourself and don't, you know, don't, don't deceive yourself into thinking that you're going to be okay with um, doing commissions and stuff like that um, just because you need the money to, um, to do your living. It's like art is very, a very emotional thing. And um, I promise you that if you have that particular temperament, uh, you're still going to hate it, even if it's putting food on your table. And that's a very unhealthy situation to be in. At that point, you should have just gotten a normal job for sure. Ani Rude says, help, is having 0.5 millimeter offset in center and one to three millimeters in surrounding an industry standard. I have a Huey on 24 4K, there's an offset issue, and that's what customer service is telling me. Is this a common thing? Yeah, it's never on the nose. For these types of tablets, yeah. There's always gonna be a slight offset. One to three millimeters at the edges? That does sound like a lot. Yeah, I would te test your calibration. Like if I if I look if I go to my corners, in one corner I have about a millimeter offset down in the bottom left, but um, three sounds like a lot for the edges. But um, yeah, check your calibration. Maybe you can work that out. But um, there's always gonna be some offset. The only thing that has no offset is the iPad Pro. It uses a different kind of registration technology. So there's, on the iPad Pro, there you, with no calibration, it's just where you touch the pen tip is where the drawing goes down. There's no offset on the iPad Pro. But that's the only one. Everything else has an offset. How would you market a comic if you were just starting out both in art and to social media? I mean, how would you get random people to read it? Um, I wouldn't go in expecting you could get random people to read it. Um, unless the comic is, unless the comic has a built-in market, like let's say it's a comic about Dungeons and Dragons that you can then post in a Dungeons and Dragons Reddit or something like that. I would not sell, set yourself up for failure by expecting you could get random people to read it. Instead, pour your love into it, make it as good as you can, and if you make it as good as you can and you pour your love into it, someone is going to read it. 
and begin slowly building a relationship with your audience. That's, that is the most realistic way forward for most artists. Um, it's very, very rare to be able to engineer an explosive success. But what you can rely on is being honest with the people that reach out to you and building a relationship with them. And over time, and I do mean over time, that will have a snowballing effect that will result in people caring about you and so caring about your, your work. You know, I, I've had to do that. You know, people people have seen me around online for years and years, you know, and, and the the people who encountered me earlier on in my online presence, as my online presence grew, they they helped, you know, I don't know how to put it, but it's like they put out there the vibe that like Steven's a guy. He's not just a random, he's like a guy. There's some momentum behind his presence or something like that. And that means a lot in the current era, if I'm being perfectly honest. Like, um, the world is not a perfect meritocracy, you know? And, it's, and it's art certainly is not. At the absolute top levels, it may be, you know? The, the top 1% of the 1% of work will be completely impossible to ignore, but outside of those rarefied realms, um, you need to have a relationship with people. Have you ever gone to a comic zine fest? Uh, yeah, I've been to some, uh, like the New York zine fair and things like that. I did this so stupid. I I don't know why I didn't save a layer for the um for the Venom logo. I guess I just wasn't sold on taking it all the way when I did this uh when I did the layer stack. It's completely impossible to work around. I think I'm just going to paint over it. I think I'm just gonna paint through it and then I'll redo it over the rendering because um, it's gonna ruin everything for me to try to like paint up to the edges of the logo. So I'm just going to destroy it. We'll add it back in later. Never be afraid to just destroy stuff all willy-nilly. When you encounter moments like that in your pieces, don't get stuck hesitating or kind of mewling around and wishing you could think of some other way to fix it. It's like, you didn't spend that long on that thing anyway. It's like, I drew that logo in all of a minute. You just get married to it once it's down. It don't matter.
Wouldn't you be better lasso and copy it? Nah. Just like I said, it's like, just because it's there doesn't mean it's worth saving, you know? And if I'm gonna put it over the rendering that I, like I'm removing it because I wanna render under it. So if I'm really gonna render it, then I'd rather redo the shape because then I can follow the bumps and contours of the rendering to make it feel like it's really wrapping around the forms. It's like, there's no need to save something that I did in all of a minute, you know? That's just gonna, if I'm gonna honor every little thing like that, it's, uh, you're gonna get stuck using a bunch of mediocre stuff in your pictures that would have been just better redone, you know? Interesting music, just a little lo-fi. How do I stop myself from hating people who use AI and those who give them credit? Um, try to remember how tall General Sherman in Sequoia National Park is. Let's see how tall he is. Take a look. This is the best way to not be mad at people who use AI. General Sherman tree. General Sherman is a giant sequoia tree located in the giant forest of Sequoia National Park in Tular County in the United States state of California. By volume, it is the largest known living single stem tree on earth. It is estimated to be around 2,200 to 2,700 years old. While General Sherman is the largest currently living tree, it is not the largest historically recorded tree. The Lindsay Creek tree, with more than 90,000 cubic feet, that's 2,500 cubic meters, almost twice the volume of General Sherman, was reportedly felled by a storm in 1905. Another larger coast redwood, the Crannell, the Crannell Creek Giant, a coast redwood, cut down in the mid-1940s near Trinidad, California, is estimated to have been 15 to 25% larger than the General Sherman tree by volume. How tall is General Sherman? 275 feet tall, 275 feet. You just think about that for a little bit, I think you'll have a hard time being angry at anybody. Fish flops with the 10. SGD giving me ka a a a a a fi e e e e e e he he ye he. Thank you so much, Fish Flops. You know I love it. You know I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the coffee. I need the caffeine. I'm gonna need the caffeine. I'm gonna need the caffeine. We know how life is. We know how things get. We know what's rearing its ugly head in life, in the art world, everywhere. We need the coffee. Humans need that most valuable of all drugs, delicious caffeine, to get us through it, to give us energy, focus, and love. Thank you, Fish Flops. You're the best, you know that. I can't wait. Can't wait to drink that coffee. 
getting emotional just thinking about it. That sweet, sweet brown just sliding right down my gullet. <laughs> Super excited for that. Love that sweet, sweet brown. Hold on a quick sec, everybody. Just designing form, my favorite way to pass time. It is actually my favorite way to pass time. What a weird thing to be your favorite pastime, designing form. <laughs> Let me grab my sketch here. I can look at how I wanted to do the, the belly guts. Nick says, what was your reaction to the death of Amu Haji? I am afraid I'm unfamiliar with Amu. Amu? Amu? I'm generally saddened by the death of anybody. Iron Penguin says, hello, Stephen. Just a quick question out of curiosity. Do you draw every day? Do you have an average number of hours you try to draw in a day? I do draw most days, yes. Um, in my old age, now that I have entered the decrepitude of antiquity, I do, um, I do take more days off now. Just, um, I don't, um, I try not to let the, I'm more aware these days of when I'm drawing out of guilty compulsion as opposed to a loving, peaceful desire to be creative. So, and, and I was definitely burdened by that for a big portion of my life. You know, I was really caught up with, I'm sure many of you are familiar with just feeling like I had something to prove or I needed it to look like I was working hard so that people would take my desire to be an artist seriously. Um, 
And that made it, you know, very difficult to spend time with friends or to put anything on the calendar because my mind had entered this, I mean, let's be honest here, very maladaptive, neurotic um, need to be like, I need to dump as much time into drawing as possible because that's the right thing to do or what I should be doing. Um, and that doesn't mean that was the state all the time, right? There, there, was, there was also times in there where things were aligned and I was doing it for the love of it. There's a reason I'm, I'm interested in doing that at all. But um, now in my, as I'm older, I see how deeply unhealthy and unnecessary that is. So um, now I have plenty of days where, thank God, um, like day, like on the weekends when I'm hanging out with my wife or family or things like that. I don't draw on those days. I just talk to human beings, listen to what's up in the world, relax. Um, and I'm much more mindful of how, because it's still there, right? I, I still, um, it'll still pop up every now and then. I'll still get this dirty feeling while I'm out at dinner of like, aren't I an art teacher? People want to learn art from me because I'm good. Shouldn't I be uh, dumping all of these hours in which I could be in communion with another conscious being into silently drawing over the table? Um, I used to take those thoughts very seriously uh, and now I laugh at them. <laughs> so I take much more days off now. My boy talks to people sometimes. Batsbug says, woke up and checked YouTube. The pod is streaming a great motivation. Thank you. I'm happy to be of service. Khalid Mame says, I've tried AI stable diffusion for ideas. It's not bad. Heathen, deceiver, blasphemer. Hubs Junkyard says, loving your venom, Stephen. Very cool. Thank you, Hubs. I'm just kidding, Khalid. You're not a blasphemer. There's no religion in art. Art is not a dogmatic thing, or at least it shouldn't be. Any tips about using charcoal to create finished creature pieces? It's, it's not what I would use. It's not what I would personally choose. Um, but um, it can be done, but uh, I unfortunately can't give great tips there because I don't use charcoal. I, I've used it a bit here and there, but never for anything serious or robust. C. Buckthorn says, hi, Steven, not to be a creepazoid, but I had a dream you were an art teacher at my school, giving your usual good advice and critiques. I was imploring you to consider taking me as your apprentice. Whilst hearing me out, you were just smiling to yourself as though you were already aware we were in a dream and was waiting for me to make that realization. I remember that dream. That was a good one. I really liked the way that you rendered the, uh, the school and your, your imploring to be my apprentice was a very nicely worded and honestly extremely... Um, compelling. It was a, a very good dream. Thank you for inviting me into that one. I had a lot of fun in that one.
for the love of God. Let's get that out. Steve Jang says, I keep resorting to trying to understand shapes of anatomy by copying rather than memorizing each part. Is memorizing anatomy necessary? Like the names. Um, it depends on your goals. I mean, the, I would argue that for most people, learning the names makes remembering the anatomy on a high level much easier. It seems like a chore, but the actual chore is trying to remember all of these discrete forms in great form detail without knowing their names. That, that's actually the bigger chore. Um, I don't think learning the names is actually all that hard and it does make things easier. So for most people, I would advise just learning the names. It makes it, makes it much easier to grok the, the situation when you're just starting out with it. Um, but if you don't have any realistic plans of drawing like a lot from memory, I don't think a deep dive in anatomy is... No, let me correct that because even if it's not from memory, um, if you don't plan on drawing a lot very realistically, um, I don't think it's that important. I don't personally. If you, if you plan on doing tons of stylized work or if you plan on doing work that is mostly clothed, for example, like if you're going to do costumed characters and things like that and you know that's what you're going to go for rather than stuff like this, right? Everything about this drawing that I'm doing lets me know that I'm the kind of artist who should know a lot of anatomy. But if you plan on doing, you know, Girls wearing dresses, I don't know. Um, where it's all kind of flowing and stuff like that. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that you need to know a lot of anatomy for that. Like, you just don't. It all depends on your goals. Now let's make this belly area transition in some interesting kind of a way. Are you gonna put Venom's chest piece on? Yeah, at the end once I've rendered this area. It was on there before I took it off. It was in the way of the painting, which is my fault. I messed up. I didn't uh, think ahead on my layers.
I found a lot of great figure drawing artists on YouTube, you being one, thank you. Can't really find someone who does a lot of videos on clothes or just drawing clothes recommendations. The best clothing resource I have ever encountered is um, one that most people don't talk about, but uh, it was one of my favorite art books as a kid. It is Drawing the Clothed Figure by Barbara Bradley. For, um, for my money, that's one of the best art books ever written. Um, it's one of the rare ones that teaches draftsmanship and not just design, like straight objective information about materials or technique. There's very, very few books that teach draftsmanship. I think um, it's like drawing, drawing Lessons from the Great Masters by Robert Beverly Hale and Drawing the Clothed Figure by Barbara Bradley. There's so few other books that teach draftsmanship. So you'll learn about clothes in that book, but you'll also learn a lot about just what to pay attention to while you draw. Thank you, Andre King. Can you write those in the chat, please? The exact name might be a little off, but it's basically... That might not be the exact name, but uh, if you Google that, you'll find it. What do you mean they don't teach draftsmanship? What is this mysterious shit? Um, it's hard to explain. It really is. Um, it's like draftsmanship as a category is like what ideas you should be paying attention to while drawing. Like um, how to evaluate what's a good shape or a bad shape for the purpose that you're going for. Do you want to design the values to emphasize local value variations, or do you want to design the values to emphasize the overall light and shadow effect? A lot of people, no one's even brought up like, oh, that's a choice to be made, right? And then much less is that even a choice. It's like, what criteria do you use to make an evaluation like that? And um, Lots of people's styles are basically them just, you know, they've never even analyzed that there's those two options or things like that. Barbara Bradley explains all those things. She covers all those things in her book. Azazin, Azazin says, what you mean by universal forces? What do you think I mean? Ghost alien demons. What else would I mean? Frickin' gray alien Beelzebubs. We're talking folksy American gray aliens with big eyes and fetoid heads, but with giant wings, and they're biblically accurate, but also not biblically accurate. And um, they're jamming Bob Dylan out on electric space guitars. And... Uh, they're probing me. They're probing me, Doug. I don't know what it is, but they got it in there.
Did we transition from dreams to nightmares? We're always oscillating between the two. Thuman says, love your art, Stephen. Thank you so much, Thuman. You're very kind. I appreciate that. Sweetness goes a long way around here. I'm having trouble understanding what is the job of a storyboard artist? Are they in charge with the framing, composition, and pacing of a scene? Isn't that a director's job, however? It is the director's job, but the storyboard artist shows that to them. Like, the director is the one who decides this scene is going to be extremely fast-paced and it's going to have a lot of close cuts to inserts of actions and things like that. The storyboard artist shows them that finds a way to produce that feeling with the visuals. Um, the director looks at it or you make an animatic out of it. The director's like, oh, that does feel like what I was hoping for, sign off. Or feels, no, that's not quite right. Feedback, feedback, feedback. There you go. Oh, Thuman has an AI video. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Everybody's got to go check out Thuman's AI video. I just popped in to say hi, have fun, y'all. Thanks for popping in, Thuman. Talk soon. Look at this sexy expert fan art, says Joe. Yeah, Joe knows. This is my, my one piece of fan art for the year. My one piece of fan art for the year always winds up being um, Venom, Carnage, or Hulk. That's always what it is, because those are, <laughs> those designs just my drawings accidentally become those because those designs are built on anatomy and mass and transformation and extremeness. Why is Marvel not hiring you to do covers? Well, I think that's, um, that's fine as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> And to be clear, the reason they're not hiring me is because I don't have a comics cover portfolio. You need the portfolio to get jobs like that. You've got to put it out there. It's not art director's jobs to extrapolate from your other kinds of pictures to what you could do. You need to package it for them, brand it for them, and show them that you can do exactly what they're looking for. So just to, uh, I know Joe's joking. I just wanted to edify the beginners out there. It's like, you're not gonna get jobs doing the stuff you want just by kind of doing vaguely related stuff. It's like, you just need to show the thing. That's the only way to get the jobs. I'm gonna simplify the chest area a bit. a bunch of edges. Let's see how we can put our spider guy back on.
just slugging it in so I can see what layer mode is going to work. Color dodge actually works decently, surprisingly. Whoa. Hello, am I still here? Okay, I'm back. Sorry, my bits dropped to zero there for a second. I don't know what that was about. The bits. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. Let me look at my uh, my bits here. I'm getting angry warnings from YouTube. Yeah, I'll open the widget, leave me be. Can you go away? Should be all right, I don't know what it's complaining about. Let me look up what Venom's spider here looks like. How does one go about becoming an art director? Um, usually you need to go in at the illustrator or junior level in whatever field you wanna be an art director in. Um, you don't need to do that for long, but you usually need to do that to build trust from someone um, and to build connections with people you can then hire. But yeah, you basically go in at the junior level or what have you, meet people, meet other directors, meet other artists. And then um, once you have a few projects that you've done a lot on under your belt, you can basically just start billing yourself as, a, as an art director. You know, there's no licensure or anything like that. You can say you are one if you're willing to take on the work. But um, you, it's not the kind of job you usually get if people don't, know you. That's why it's important to have uh, good connections in the industry. People need to know that you've gone from start to finish on the job before and that you know how to do the whole job so that they can trust you to hire your own artists, subcontractors, and to uh, see the project through all the way to finish and you know how to what the people who are going to be working under you um, need to do. That's very hard knowledge to get if you haven't done the job yourself as well. Why can't I find a clear shot of Venom's frickin' uh, thing here? All right. Modern day James. The inimitable modern day James. The infatigable modern day James. Chame. What the? Oh, come on. Here to be annoying, says James. We're happy to be annoyed. We're always happy to be annoyed by you, James.
I don't know if I like that thing that long. I think I gotta go with a more graphic shape for the legs because uh, my overall anatomy here is going to make the little separations between the legs look totally junk. Currently exhausted. Oh, my dear James, I'm sending you psychic energy. I hope you're feeling it. I'm sending you powerful psychic energy. Esoteric energies from the depth of the consciousness void. Stephen TJ Azien is talking about lawsuits against Dolly and OpenAI. Let's see. Let me do some Googling. I'm not seeing a new one. Send me a link if anybody uh, has it. But, um, oh, and Microsoft. Yes, I believe if you're talking about the one that's Microsoft, GitHub, and OpenAI, we, um, we did talk about that uh, on the stream on Friday, I want to say. Was that Friday? That was on the stream on Friday. And if you guys want to learn more about that, that's uh, go to GitHubCopilotLitigation.com. First class action of its type against AI companies. Now, I do, I do not believe that in that lawsuit, OpenAI is on the hook for Dolly, um, as I understand it. I believe that in that lawsuit, uh, OpenAI is in trouble in its association with uh, GitHub Copilot, as I understand it.
Let's keep it more graphic like that for my venom. And let's see how much we wanna. So what I usually do for a value decision like this is um, I'll squint my eyes and I'll bring the value change in and I'll stop right where it's very clear to me, even with my eyes squinted. That way I leave some room to do further work into it instead of going full contrast. Seeing if I can see it when I look at the thumbnail. So at about 60% opacity is where it's clear to me when I squint my eyes. So I'm gonna leave it there for now. And then I know I'm gonna add color dodgy highlights on this. So let me just slug those in too so I can make sure that the value ranges are all playing nice, all playing nicely. First water. How do you learn concept art if it is really unaffordable for me? I've used so many resources on YouTube, but I feel it's just not enough. Currently, I really don't know um, I can get my work critiqued. Um, if you really can't afford it, just focus on designing. I know this might be hard to believe, but take it from me. This is really true. Just focus on designing stuff you like. Um, it's, you can't learn concept art. It's not a, a lot of people want to bill it like it's, um, a thing, like a monolithic thing that it's like, it's this skill set, and every game and movie and stuff like that needs that skill set. And it just isn't true. It really isn't true. Um, if you can't afford all this stuff that's like, I'll teach you how to be a concept artist, don't worry about it. You can come back to it later. Just focus on being a good designer. The important thing is to be a good designer. And the most important part of being a good designer is to iterate over and over again on designing things. So pick movies, TV shows, books, or stories that you love, that you're a really big fan of from your life, and just redesign them. Change the genre, change the time period, change the cultural influence, and let your familiarity with the product guide you to interesting and thoughtful questions about it. And that's always going to be the most important practice for a designer. That's always gonna be more important than, you know, how to integrate photos without it looking like shit, you know, whatever concept art tip anyone has. It's like, you can come back to those things later and there's surely useful tips there, but no one, if that's all you knew, if you were excellent at literally all of that stuff, you knew Photoshop right up the asshole, you understood everything about value configurations and stuff like that, color theory, you still wouldn't, that doesn't mean you're a good designer. That still doesn't mean anyone would wanna hire you for a concept art job. You need to connect with the content. You need to connect with the content. So I'm not saying that stuff doesn't matter at all, right? You will likely need to go learn some of that stuff, but if you can't afford it for now, the most important thing that you do need to learn is freely available. You just need to practice it. Hey Zapata, would it be okay if I model one of your concepts? Of course. You go right ahead.
I don't know that that value range is what I want for this. Let me do it right in the right in the goop. Right in the soup. That's what it's gonna take. I need it to blend in more nicely with the actual picture pixels underneath. Radika says, modern day James, your content has been so helpful. Thanks for existing. James's content is extremely helpful, isn't it? If y'all don't know James and his content, go check it out. James is the boss hog. He's a big oinkin' hog. But everybody looks at that oinkin' hog and they're like, that's the boss. That's the boss hog. Does Venom also have a nasty texture to him usually? Let me look at what the comic book drawings look like. Eh, I mean, I guess everybody draws them different. Everybody draws them different. I'll do the afternoon live stream shift. Yeah, everybody just switch over there to James once I'm done here. Is isolation good or bad? I can't really decide. If by even trying to find friends, I'm throwing away an immense gift, or if by sharing it, it will only get bigger, this gift of life. Uh, I think isolation is generally not good. You know, different strokes for different folks, but uh, I think except for the rare mountain man, uh, isolation does more harm than good to most people. In my humble opinion. We all need friends. I'm not rushing this one. I'm just enjoying building things up nice and slow.
make this a little bigger since I don't think we're doing a, another drawing. My image size is taking a long time. I don't know if I'm ready to commit to this. Yeah, I'm not. I'm canceling. Can I get it up uh, just to 12,000? Will that go? Thank you, Kip Dib Wifflifter. What lo-fi playlist is this? This is the low, low fidelity playlist on Epidemic Sound. Talking in a Steven Zapata stream while I should be working on a commission. Woohoo. Oh, oh no. Anirud, Anirud, you bad boy. How could you do that? How could you do that? You should be doing your commission. Okay, this is not gonna go fast enough. It seems to be getting completely hung up. That's weird. Something's wrong here. It's usually very fast for me to up my image size on stuff like this. I don't know what that's about. Some sort of glitch. Hey Steven, can you name a few artists with similar art to yourself, super light gray and detailed? You mean like uh, my pencil drawings? Um, well, if you like my pencil drawings, definitely check out like um, Miles Johnston, who you probably already know. He's extremely popular, but uh, his pencil drawings are gorgeous. Um, the light gray thing. I don't know, who else does very light drawings like some of mine? Um, I don't know, I don't know if I can do that specifically, but you know, just to name some of my pencil influences, check out Wes Burt's um, older pencil drawings. He doesn't really do that many pencil drawings these days, but um, his older pencil drawings were hugely influential on me back when I encountered them in my early teen years. Check out Marko Djurjevic's pencil drawings. My friend Ahmed's pencil drawings. He's got a lot online you can find. That's Ahmed al -Duri. That's Ahmed al -Duri to you. All right, what exactly do I want to do here? What exactly do I want to do here? I want to start getting the sinewy venom thing going on, having things bleed into each other, cross over each other, do unreal things that don't happen on the actual anatomy.
Did you say he's popular, but his drawings are gorgeous? If I did, that's not what I meant. What I was alluding to there is that it's unlikely that if you know me that you don't know Miles. That's what I meant by that. There's just like a, uh, there's people of a certain scale that I'm sure the overlap of their audience with mine is 100%. <laughs> Everyone who's in my audience is already in theirs. And Miles is definitely one of them. Do you think pain is important for art? What if art could be a way to transform pain into utter joy? Um, it can do that, I believe, but I don't think pain is important for art. It can be important to a person. Your particular traumas and things like that can really, they can make you think deeply about things and they can certainly influence you as a person. And if you're lucky, you can have relationships with your trauma that you experience as growth, as you making meaning out of them. And um, you can f come to find that stuff very valuable. But for every person who can make meaning out of their trauma and come to sort of feel fortunate for the growth they had, there's another person whose trauma really doesn't allow that and who has no interest in making meaning out of it. It is simply senseless suffering. Um, and for them, I don't, I don't think there's any need for them to bring their pain into their art if uh, they're uninterested in that. So um, yeah, I don't think pain is deeply important to art on some existential level. I think uh, art runs just fine being a process of joy and happiness. But if it is important to you as an individual, it makes sense to bring it into your art and art will certainly transform it and do interesting things to it. But I think what, what artists need most in the current era is less, um, less pain. They need to learn how to mine the joy from art that is there. I think that things are a little bit out of balance these days. I think uh, it's very easy to have a extremely painful relationship with art in the current era, and it's rarer to do it happily and peacefully. So I think that our focus these days needs to be on finding ways to do that. Hi, Michal. Let's see if we want the rim lighting. I saw someone mentioned earlier in the chat that they dreamed of rim lighting on this piece. Let's see. If I get a, mm, it doesn't work right there. If I get a more defined um, shadow side over on the left. Like if I get like a real sharp black shadow edge here. It's 
It's like, I, I want, when I do rim lighting, I want to use it because it's useful. You know, I, I need it to pop off forms over near the contour that are sort of failing at the moment. But um, I just don't think I need it here. Yeah, it's just not not right now. It's not bringing it's not bringing attention to important parts of the design. It's always in the tool bag though. That doesn't mean it won't come back.
Multi Sanchito says, is form from imagination going on sale? It is. The info is over there on the left side of the screen. The dates are in that icon. If you can't read them, it's going on sale from November 21st to November 28th. So at the end of this month. James is doing the good work out there, trying to get people to go to therapy. Very important, very important. No problem, Carla. Thanks for being here. Colin Noseworthy says, is 3D sculpting just a for fun thing you learned, or have you intended to do anything with it in a professional sense? Um, well, it wasn't purely just for fun. I, I was always interested in, I was always interested in it because um, 
being a form-based artist, obviously sculpting appeals to me because it, it's, it's dealing with the same stuff that I like to deal with in drawing just in a different way. Um, so I was always interested in it just because it's like, ah, yes, real form, another way to create form. And I love sculptures. You know, I'm just a huge fan of sculptures in general. Um, so it wasn't just for fun in that sense, which is already a lot, but also because you mean like, did I ever think I would get like hired to do ZBrush sculptures for um, a project or something like that? No, never. Because um, when I started, when I gave it some serious attempts at learning it, I had already been, um, I had already gained some knowledge about the industries and stuff like that. So it was clear to me that um, you don't really do that unless you know 3D up and down. It's a, it's an extremely technical industry. And it's like, it, it's nice if you can sculpt beautifully, but in 3D, it's like if, if you don't know how to retopologize, if you don't know how to make it low, mo uh, low poly, um, there's only so useful that's gonna be to people and they're probably not gonna, it's very rare to get hired just off raw sculpting ability. Um, at the very least, they're gonna have to pay someone to clean your crap up. So um, for, for me, no, I never had any realistic, um, any realistic intentions about using it in a professional setting. Again, for referencing, yes, but not for like, ah, I'm being hired as a 3D sculptor now. John GDDR5 says, Stephen or anyone in the chat, do you have any horse or animal anatomy books you would recommend to study? Um, I would check out the Joe Weatherly Guide to Drawing Animals. That um, That's not strictly an animal anatomy book, but it teaches the more important stuff. It teaches the draftsmanship principles that apply to drawing animals. And I think that's way more bang for your buck for someone who wants to get into an animal, animal drawing at first.
Gemmel, what's up? Thank you for the kind words. Glad you like the venom. Hey Steven, what are your thoughts on traditional to digital workflows in a professional environment? Um, I don't think there are any problem in a professional environment. I mean, the you just need to keep the traditional part pretty light in a, in a professional environment just because of time constraints. But I don't think there's, in most professional environments, no one's gonna care if you like do your initial sketches um, on paper and then scan them or take a photo and then work them up, like what I did here. Like I did that sketch with my morning coffee and then I threw it in Photoshop and I'm elaborating on it digitally. No one's gonna care if you do that. I mean, that's totally, totally fine. Totally workable. Um, to spend a really long time doing traditional, that's gonna be a problem in most settings. In most professional settings these days, it will be a problem. It just takes longer than your boss is generally willing to pay you for. <laughs> but if it's just a little bit of time spent traditional, no problem. Use it for what it's good for, the initial energy and connection and things like that, and then switch it over. Steven, is this for a, for a job, for a project, or just for fun? I've never seen you draw fan art before. I do like one fan art piece a year, and it's always Venom or Hulk, <laughs> because my drawings accidentally become that. When I say one a year, I'm kidding. It just, that tends to be the rate at which I'll do anything like that. I don't do a lot, um, but it's just for fun. Any project work, any stuff for a job, you can't really do that online. Unless it's a commission for just a regular person, they'll let you stream it. But um, for the vast majority of professional jobs, you could not be doing it online. Anything you see me doing on my YouTube channel is never for a job, ever. It's always just for me. Do you find traditional more fun than digital? I personally do better drawings on paper, which is sometimes frustrating when I'm doing digital. Um, I find them fun for different things. Uh, like what I'm doing right now, I would much rather be doing this on paper. Like the actual act that I'm doing right now of like creating striations and hunting for weird configurations of forms and stuff like that. This is much easier for me to do on paper, much more fun. Um, and it would look better because of that. 
uh, I would find better solutions because I'd just it'd be easier for me to sink into them. But um, what I don't like doing on paper with pencil is um, trying to make it feel dark the way that this does, where it's like a full black gray field. That's a real pain in the ass when working um, when working traditional. So it's like I like them. They make certain things easier, and perhaps that makes them more fun. So digital definitely makes it easier to get large fields of value and color and to have flexibility within those fields. But um, I do not find it the most useful for deeply sinking into a work. For that, for me, traditional is the way to go. It's just not... Um, it's not as relaxing and inviting as traditional. You know, I'm 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 staring at a light bulb right now. You know, it's it's eight inches from my face. It's like there's only it's only so there's only so comfortable I can be.
Got to figure out how I want these transitions to work. Don't give me this stuff about the widget. Feels like I can reach out and touch Venom. Looks good. Reach out and touch Venom. Your own personal Venom. Reach out and touch Venom. Brings back road trip memories. Ah, the oldies. Song's a jam, though. Look, just reach out and touch Venom. Reach out and touch Venom. Well, call me anytime you can come here, baby. Day or night, call me.
Steven, what are your most useful tips for drawing faces? I struggle with that part the most, but the body seems easier. Um, if I had to boil it down in one thing, it'd be stop looking at the features. The number one thing that, for my kind of drawing, the number one thing that holds people back on faces and heads is that they can't stop focusing on the high contrast, honestly incidental facts of the eyes, the nose, the lips. And the way, that's not a bad thing if you understand them in context, but the the way beginners tend to look at those features is that they, they can't help it. They just see them as graphic shapes. They just see eyebrows as particular shapes, eyelashes as particular shapes, the value and color change that make the lips into flat graphic shapes. Um, you've got to realize how distracting that is to the real facts of the face, which is it's raw mass. Um, I think that a lot of people would benefit greatly by spending some time drawing, obsessing about the masses of flesh between the facial features rather than the facial features themselves. And there's a lot of things we could then extrapolate from that, like looking at it as basic geometric shapes, looking at its overall planar uh, aspects, but um, those are all much deeper holes. But if I had to boil it down to one thing, it's that. It's like, stop looking at the features, at the attention grabbing features, and look at the totality of the head and all of the fleshy mass between the features. Hello, girl. Yes, I know. I know. I know. It's so hard to be a little dog. It's so hard to have brown eyes and a pink little nose and freckles. It's so hard to have a big bushy mane and lots of long hairs coming off your ears. And nothing's harder than having a stinky, stinky butt. It's so hard having a stinky, stinky butt. Everywhere you go, everybody looking at your butt and whiffing, whiffing, whiffing. It's so hard. So embarrassing. Nobody understands how hard it is to be a little dog. How? What is with a dog's internal clock? It's 12 o'clock on the nose when she comes and stretches on my chair. How do they know exactly what time is cookie time? She's like, it's lunchtime. You motherfucker. Where's my cookie at? You can't call me motherfucker, right, baby? You know I'm your goddamn dad. You know I'm your goddamn dad. You can't call me motherfucker. Sit. Down. Play the... Good girl. Spin. Sit pretty. That's a good girl. Come on, get out of here.
She's working so hard. Yeah, she got to work for the cookies. You've got to work for the cookie. We don't hand out free cookies around here. Not in this apartment. No way, no how. Brian Medina says, damn, dude, how do you have the patience and skill to draw that? <laughs> you fool. I was born that way. You may think you can catch up, but that'd be completely impossible. It's my destiny to be this good. I don't know what to tell you. For some of us, it just comes easy. How long you been drawing? As long as the stars have been in the sky. As long as the waves have lapped at the sandy ocean shore. As long as the leaves have tumbled from their faded places season after season after season. For as long as one beast has consumed another. For as long as the wind has blown to and fro, from heat to cold, as long as there has been pain, and as long as there has been love. About 16 years, about 16 years. Actually, it's my whole life. I always say 16 years, because that's when I remember becoming improvement focused, but I've been drawing my whole life, since I was a little kid. That was like five. How do you draw the Maximus Maximus? I've been trying to understand its intersection and origin, but it always evades me. All right, real quick, real quick tutorial. All right, so the problem that most people have with the Maximus Maximus is that they forget about the general shape. So it's like, if you're really focused on the Maximus Maximus, it has to read on the silhouette, like its overall shape has to be correct. So it's like, you got the human head up here, say it's something like that, neck comes down, so we got one shoulder over there, and then the Maximus Maximus edits the silhouette so that it's like, yeah, you know? And then it comes down here into the small of the back, and then you get the Maximus Minimus, which is more commonly known as the gluteal butts. And then you just gotta fit all of the other muscles into here. So this is the trapezoid, which interacts this way with the maximus maximus. This is the infrasplendugu. This is the terrasus majoris. 
This is the rhombidius. You gotta mirror them symmetrically. On the other side, of course, the ladicinus dicni wraps around that way, sort of plunges to the forward side of the armpit. The erection pinae down here at the bottom. Sacral triangle. Gluteals. Wasp wasticus. And then the chickenus legacus. It's that simple. It's that simple. I like the way this guy came out. This middle member here. I don't know, I like the overall look of that. That's got something cool going on. Ooh, getting real hungry. Just want to do a little bit more. I'd like to figure out how I want to handle this hand before I get going. <laughs> you would like the middle member. I'm carrying a middle member right now. Brian Medina says, your drawing has so many lines. If I were to try and draw that, it would take me days, probably weeks to draw something even remotely close. Try years, forget years, decades. No matter how much effort you put in, there's no way you could do a drawing like mine. It would be absolutely impossible for you. Ching, 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 ching. I hate four kids dub Steven. <laughs> I hate him too. You think I like being like this?
Let's move this thumb. I think we could get more utility out of some stretching on the thumb pad. Maybe something more like that. Yeah, that feels better to me. He reminded me of the teacher in Whiplash. Oh, I see you're talking about people you met. I had a teacher once who worked 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. on like six different projects at once and said, if you can't match that, you can't work in the big, scary, capital I industry. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people out there with uh, not much to base their personalities on. <laughs> Just really, um, taking drawing goblins way too seriously. Sorry if anybody's getting motion sickness as I rotate like crazy around this hand. <laughs> At least in this context where it's just like transforming them, being free with them, they're so much fun. It's so much fun arranging all the little bits.
All right, yeah, that'll work. That will work. All right, I'm gonna start wrapping up stream because I'm getting very hungry. It's lunchtime for SB. Lunchtime for SB. If anybody's got any last questions or anything like that, throw them in the chat. Throw them in the chat. We had fun drawing today. We did a Venom. We did a Venom. Reach out and touch Venom. Look, just reach out and touch Venom. We don't want to just see Venom Man. We want to touch Venom Man. You police, you, you government officials, you're up there in your ivory tower. You're saying we can't touch Venom. We want to touch Venom Man. We're not just content to just see Venom. You guys are gatekeeping Venom. We want to touch Venom Man. You gotta touch Venom. Happy lunch, Steven. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Maybe we'll come back and do the legs on this guy. Manana. The big tomorrow. What makes you want to digitally paint a pencil drawing versus rendering it traditionally? Um, I prefer rendering traditionally. Uh, this one, just, I don't know. I did the sketch and uh, I thought I wanted it to be Venom. And um, Venom's design hinges on the large value read of him being a solid black silhouette um, or purple blue, depending on whatever design you're looking at. So for that, for how committed I felt to it, it was obvious that I needed to go um, digital because you know it, it would take a very long time to get a solid black base for a pencil rendering like that. With pencil, I could have used markers or something like that, but I didn't really plan this out thoroughly. Uh, and digital is very good at that, at getting a solid silhouette, clean base for a value. Um, pencil, very gray, very washed out. I could have spent the next three hours trying to get the, <laughs> the silhouette base dark enough. So that's all it was. It's just that Venom's design asked for it. It needs a nice dark base. What you eating for lunch? I don't know. I actually don't know. I'm a little light on options right now. I'm gonna have to go poke around after this. Please come give more art advice in my dreams again. No problem. You got it. I can promise you. Yep. Yep. Steven, will we ever see Thyrandor again? And how do you make strong shapes work with anatomy and making it work without it looking super unrealistic? Um, you kind of... You have to ask yourself what part of the shape you want to push and let the other part of it kind of carry the realism for you if you want it to not look unrealistic. So um, what I usually do is I push the two-dimensional shape of any given anatomical element, but I let the rendering that I do make it look realistic. So the lighting, the modeling, um, triggers in the viewer's eye that this is a real looking thing, even if the individual 2D shapes that make it up are totally wild and totally out there. Um, so it, the 2D shapes are just as crazy as possible and then let the rendering handle the realism. Why does it matter to work an X number of hours? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, as, as the years wear on, you start finding where you're comfortable, where you get hit burnout and stuff like that. And you can find numbers that work for you generally. But um, as like blanket statements or anything like that, it does not matter that you work a certain number of hours. And pushing yourself to hit a certain arbitrary number of hours is prob would, will probably hurt you in the long run on your journey. You probably don't want to do that. Is the dream visiting a new program you are offering? Yeah, we're soft launching it, we're test running it. It's in the beta, uh, early access, invite only. Um, the dream visitation mentorship program, yeah. 
well, you know, as, as things get more developed, we'll release more info soon enough. Do you think Mobius was a line-based artist? I think so, personally. Daryl Grant says, speaking of dreams, I forgot to say that I had a dream where you released the full video of the subliminal dancing Steven that appears during the countdown, and I could not stop laughing when I woke up. Now that's weird. I'm glad that cracked you up. Don't you love a dream that makes you laugh so hard it wakes you up? I love those, those are so weird. I love waking up laughing. Are you gonna make a background for him? Can you put him staring, uh, standing in line at the DMV because his license is expired? If I do give him a background, I will do that. I'll make it a DMV scene. A bit of encouragement to keep drawing and not give up because of AI, please. Yeah, don't give up because of AI. It's not time to give up. It is time for action for vigor and for belief. Do not give up because of the AI. Don't forget that no one, we don't know how the AI thing is gonna shake out. And um, I personally feel a lot of optimism. I know that may sound like a surprise coming from me, but um, as my research continues, as I continue to gain more knowledge, as I continue to talk to more people, um, I've only been, more, been made more optimistic by, um, how to put this, more optimistic about the depth of their fuck up and the, re the, real, the realism or the practicality of holding them accountable and creating some sort of recourse, nudging things in a better direction, creating some sort of legislation. Um, we'll go all into all of that stuff later, more, in more detail later, but um, yeah, I personally don't, I don't think you should be despairing right now. Um, yeah, I've only been made more optimistic by uh, what I've learned. We don't know how this thing's gonna shake out. Thanks for the stream, super educative, especially Baximus Maximus, I'm, you know. That's the real secrets of drawing right there, the Baximus Maximus. I mean, that's how you draw, baby. Now that's how you draw. Now that, now that's how you draw. Now that right there, baby, that right there is how you draw. Baby, baby, that's how you draw, baby. Now baby, 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 that's how you draw. Baby, oh baby, baby, oh baby, baby, oh baby. That's how you draw, baby. Ooh, that's how you draw. Ooh, look at that intense silhouette. Ooh, baby, baby, baby. The gluteus butticus, baby, the maximus, maximus. I can't stop looking at the trapezoids. Oh. The curve, the curve of the Latinitz, the power of the Tereides Majoris. Now that's how you draw, baby. Baby, that's how you draw, baby. Oh yeah, baby. All right, everybody. I'll see you soon.